Hello and welcome to workshop number four for Widener's ME474 Introduction to Finite Element course. Uh, this week's workshop is uh, shown here in this problem. We're going to be taking a cube of aluminum. It's uh, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. And what we're going to be doing this week that's different than what we've done thus far is to apply a temperature change of 100 degrees C uh, and then I say here while the cube is floating in space. So what I mean by that is that from a boundary condition standpoint, we're not going to constrain any of the faces. We're just going to have this cube floating. We're going to apply a 100 degree temperature change, and we want to see how the cube expands. Uh, you'll see listed here in the problem statement are all of the uh, necessary parameters that we'll have to input for material properties. Uh, one of the things that gets pretty tricky in Abacus while keeping track of all of your units are uh, some of the units get a little bit dicey, a little bit uh, unusual perhaps. Uh, so here I've already converted them all into the proper units that we will be using. Uh, but normally you may not find material properties in these units up front and you may have to uh, go through some conversions to get them into your consistent units. So anyway, here's the problem. Uh, so new features that we're going to talk about this week are going to be uh, anything associated with temperature and displacement combined elements. So there's a few spots you'll see where this pops up, but I think this is at least a good introductory problem into showing you how to use the uh, temperature and displacement combined. Okay, so uh, if you can, go ahead and fire up your Abacus Student Edition. For this particular problem, I am using the 2017 Student Edition. Uh, if you have older or or probably even newer versions, I'm sure the uh, functionality is mostly the same. Uh, however, it's possible that some of the buttons may be in slightly different places uh, or that perhaps some of the text may be different as well. So we're going to start the problem off uh, under our part module. We will create a new part, and I'm just going to call this part cube. It is a 3D deformable solid extrusion. And we can leave the approximate size as 200 since we're only looking at a cube of uh, 100 by 100 by 100. Now, the easiest way to model this one, if we think back to the way the problem is set up, it's a cube. Nothing is being constrained. So we can actually make use of, a lot of, of three different symmetry faces. We can have symmetry along the XZ, uh, XY, and YZ planes. So what we're going to do is draw only one quadrant of that cube, so it's going to be essentially eighth symmetry, uh, and we will be able to then uh, model the entire problem using just that small piece. So let's use our create rectangle tool, and instead of 100 by 100 by 100, we're going to make a 50 by 50 by 50, and then use three symmetry planes in order to uh, solve the problem. So we'll start our square here from 0, 0, uh, and then in order to perhaps make the uh, symmetry, if I want to reflect this in my output uh, file, uh, it might be easier to actually have this model, the uh, upper left portion here. So I'm going to have it go to negative 50, 50 to create my square. And that's it. So in this particular problem, the geometry is relatively simple. I'm going to say done. And then instead of a depth of 20, I want to make this 50 millimeters as well. And you'll see that I just have a block here now that is 50 by 50 by 50. So if the part module, we're all done. If we move into the properties, uh, the only part that gets tricky here is that we just have a lot of information that we need to input. Uh, this is going to be some new information that we haven't used in problems so far in our course. So it's important to pay attention here and make sure that you have input all of the information that you need in order to solve a thermal problem. So we're going to go ahead and create a material. Uh, we can give it a name of aluminum. And let's go down first to the ones that we're used to dealing with, which would be mechanical, elasticity, elastic. We saw we had a Young's modulus of 70 gigapascals, which if we're dealing in millimeters, we need in megapascals. And a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.3 was defined. And let's see what other information we need. We need a coefficient of thermal expansion value. So let's find where that is. If you go to mechanical and under expansion, you will see that we have an opportunity now to put in an expansion coefficient. 
And for this problem, we are going to be using 23.6 times 10 to the negative 6. So we can do 23.6 e negative 6. Okay, so we've now defined our coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, let's see what else we have. We have to define density. So that is found under general density. And here we have our mass density term. And for this problem, we're going to be using 2.7 times 10 to the 9th. Uh, metric tons divided by cubic millimeters. So it's uh, uh, how density is defined when we're dealing with millimeters. So 2.7 times 10 to the negative 9th. So we can do 2.7 e negative 9. Okay, there's my mass density. Uh, next up then would be thermal conductivity. So this is another new one. If we go under thermal, you can see the very first one is thermal conductivity. And for this problem, we need to define that one as 167,000 tons millimeter squared per second cubed. So 167,000 is the value we need. So we'll go ahead and type that in, 167,000. And the last term that is new here, we already did Poisson ratio, so that's taken care of, is the specific heat, which is in Newton millimeters per ton. And that one here would be 896 million. So 896 followed by six zeros. So that's thermal, specific heat. 896, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. 896 million. And that should be it. That's all the information we have. We have elastic. We have a coefficient of thermal expansion. We have density, thermal conductivity, and specific heat all defined. So now I can say OK and I have created my aluminum material. So next I need to create a section, and maybe we'll just call this section our cube. It is a solid, it is homogeneous. When I say continue, I can see my material aluminum is already selected, so I'll say OK. And the last part for this module is to assign that section, so I will click on Assign Section. I'll highlight my cube, say Done. And now my cube section shows up. Obviously, if I had additional ones, they would show up here as well. I've only created one section, uh, so that's what appears. And when I say OK, I can see my cube has now changed colors, indicating that I have correctly assigned a section to that particular part. So that should do it for our property module. Uh, assembly, so the last problem we had, uh, we did have an assembly with multiple parts, and we learned how to position all of those parts. Uh, this problem, we're back to just a very basic one uh, where we only have the one part. So we'll just add one instance of the part. You always need to have an assembly, however. Uh, so we do have to create the assembly with just this one part. But we don't need to position anything, so we can move on. Now, step. This one does have some new information in it this week. Uh, so maybe we'll call this one uh, temperature. because so we're going to be applying a temperature change. But rather than a static general step, we need to scroll up to where we see a coupled temperature displacement problem. So until this particular week, uh, we have only been solving just general static problems. So this time we need to change that to a coupled temperature displacement problem. And when I say continue, you'll see that it still looks uh, very similar to what we've seen in previous problems. Uh, if I come into incrementation, one thing I do have to define, however, is uh, how much allowable temperature change per increment we want. So we're going to apply a temperature change of 100. Uh, if we wanted to, we could uh, try to force some steps to happen here. Maybe we'd say, you know, I only want to have 50 as my max. I don't know, we could put in something there if we wanted to. <clears throat> um, additionally, we could mess around with our increment sizes here if we chose to. So that way, maybe I can try to see if, uh, you know, just see how the deflections are applied throughout when the temperature changes. But other than that, we can accept the rest of the defaults, and I have now created a step. If I move into interactions, again, interactions are typically where we have things like friction defined and contact. Uh, we also defined here rigid bodies in the previous workshop. This time, uh, once again, we're back to a somewhat simple problem from an interaction standpoint. Uh, in that we do not have any additional interactions. There are no parts interacting with other parts. So in this particular case, we can skip the interactions module. However, if you move into loads, <clears throat> in this particular problem now, we do have to define 
uh, several different boundary conditions up front, including our three symmetry faces. So let's start off with that. Uh, we're going to have symmetry in the x direction. So we can take a look. Here's my compass down here. If I want to make sure that uh, later on, to make my life a little bit easier, when uh, if, if we want to be able to use our symmetry faces in the uh, ODB, in the output uh, file, I want to be able to choose the faces here that are right at the origin because that's how the display is going to mirror later on. So I would like to use this face, the face that's on the back side here, and the face that's on the bottom because those are the faces that are right at my origin. So let's start off here uh, creating a boundary condition. We'll change this to my initial step. And if we use this face that's coming right at us right here, this face, we can see normal to that face is the x direction. So we're going to start off by defining our x symmetry face. Uh, that would be under mechanical symmetry. So I'll say continue. I'm going to choose uh, just that face and say done. And then this is going to be x symmetry. That's the direction normal to that face. And I can see those uh, symmetry boundary conditions appear on the screen. Now I need to rotate so I can use my middle mouse click button here, hold it down, and that will allow me to rotate. Uh, additionally, you could do it up here in the top screen if I wanted to by clicking on rotate view and then manipulating the screen that way as well. So I need to apply symmetry conditions to this face and this face. So I can see, according to my compass, this one is the Z direction. So I will click on create boundary condition. This one is Z symmetry. It's still a symmetry face, so I will say continue. I'm going to click on that back face now and say done. And this one, the Z axis is normal to that face, so I'm going to call that Z symmetry. And I can see now that that face has been highlighted with the boundary condition I chose. And lastly, we have this bottom face, which is going to be symmetry in the Y direction because the Y axis is normal to that face. So I will click on create boundary condition. This one is Y symmetry. Say continue. I will highlight that face and say done. And I will choose the Y symmetry condition. And I can now see that I have created that boundary condition on all of those faces as well. If I want to reset back to the original view, I can click on apply isometric view. And I can see now that my cube has returned to its original position and uh, everything has gone back to normal. So I'm not quite done yet. I also need to create a temperature boundary condition. So I'll click on Create Boundary Condition. This one would be listed under Other. You will see that there is a temperature. So I will call this one uh, Temp for temperature. I'll say Continue. And now Abacus once again asked me to select the regions for the boundary condition. So I'm going to apply this to the entire cube. I want the whole cube to have a temperature change applied to it. And by default, in my initial conditions anyway, I have to choose a value of zero. So it's going to initialize the problem to have a temperature everywhere of zero. But what I want to do, if we go back to our problem statement, is I'm going to be applying a temperature change of 100 degrees C. So in order to change the temperature by 100, I'm going to open up my boundary condition manager. I can see all the boundary conditions that I've created, including the temperature one, which was created in the initial condition, and then it says it's propagated into that second step. So I'm going to edit that, and I can see here that uh, it's done uh, what magnitude says zero right now, so I can change that to be 100. Uh, now it is going to apply that instantaneously. If you wanted to, you could create a, uh, an amplitude. Uh, what you'll see here is that by doing this instantaneously, it's going to happen immediately in that very first increment. So when I try to uh, force that into doing smaller increments, I'm not really going to get a lot of benefit out of that unless I change the amplitude. Uh, but in this particular problem, I'm also not all that interested. So I kind of just want to apply that temperature and see what happens. So I'm going to say OK. And now I'll see in my Boundary Condition Manager, it goes to Modified. So what that's showing me then is that I have changed that boundary condition in this step of temperature. And now uh, it's gone from 0 to 100. So I'll dismiss that window now. And as far as a loads and boundary conditions standpoint, uh, I am now complete. 
So let's move on to the mesh. I do need to check, as always, my element types. Uh, and I always forget this step as well, so I first need to change it to part. And then click on Assign Element Types. It wants me to select the region, so it's only one part that I have. I'm going to say Done. <clears throat> and you'll see by default, it starts off on this 3D stress element. But I want to scroll on down to where I find the Coupled Temperature Displacement. So I need to choose an element that allows you to uh, create displacements uh, through temperature changes. So I'm going to choose that type of element and say OK. I need to apply my nodes. Uh, let's see, by default it's going to choose 5, uh, which that looks like it's going to be a little bit too fine for a, uh, a student edition problem. What if I choose 8 here? Let's see how that looks. Uh, that could be pretty close. I'll say OK and I will click on the Create Mesh button and it tells me I've created 216 elements. Uh, so that's going to be pretty borderline. I'm allowed to have a thousand nodes in the student edition. Uh, so this might be okay. Uh, we'll have to wait till we get to the last step and find out. But if I move on from the mesh module, uh, we'll go down to the step, or the uh, job rather, I'm sorry, and we'll create a new one. I'll call that uh, Workshop 4. And I don't need to really change any of the settings here for the job. If you were running in a large parallelization on a computer cluster or something, you could play with those values, but uh, we're not really very interested in that. So I'm going to click on Submit here, and it tells me I've already created files with that name before. But uh, when I click on Submit, it is now submitted. When I come into my monitor, uh, the fact that it allowed me to submit uh, means that I didn't violate the uh, 1,000 nodes for the student edition, so we're okay. Uh, and it looks like it blazed right through that. It's all done. So we'll click on Dismiss here, and let's take a look at those results. So here's the undeformed. Uh, and when I looked at the deformed mode, and actually I uh, cheated a little bit there. I think I had this open earlier, and I was using the mirror already. So let's turn off all those mirror shapes. So I can see, though, that my deformed and undeformed, I've definitely uh, <coughs> caused the cube to expand. When I turn on my contours, take a look at those displacements and I can see that uh, uh, the red area there has a max value of uh, 0.204 millimeters so that's the expansion that I've created by uh, applying a 100 degree Celsius change and just as a refresher if I do want to have the cube appear as a full cube I can go to view ODB display options and under mirror and pattern I can turn on all three of those planes and now it actually looks like I've created one large cube uh, using those mirrored surfaces. And again, maybe not all that surprising, uh, the corners have expanded by the most, uh, 2.04, and uh, <clears throat> and so, that, so that's it. That's essentially the problem that uh, we wanted to solve. So a couple of new things that we added here this week. We uh, needed to understand how to uh, create a material property that has all of the different parameters in it that you would need in order to solve a temperature problem. Uh, we also needed to understand what type of a step we would create if we are going to do a problem involving temperature and displacement. Uh, we also needed to understand then in the mesh what types of mesh elements we needed to uh, use in order to end up with a problem with temperature and displacement as well. And uh, lastly, then, we can see at the end uh, how we used our mirrored surfaces again. That's not necessarily anything new, uh, but uh, just kind of a good refresher on, uh, on how to do that. So anyway, I hope you uh, found this workshop to be useful. Uh, definitely trying to build up some more tools so that you have a basic understanding of Abacus and how to use some of those uh, basic functions. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or uh, leave some comments under this video, and I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. And look forward to workshop number five next week.